Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, college football fans across the nation and around the world. This is Tim May with the Tim May Podcast. Yeah, I'm revved up. Uh, number one, I got my my. Uh, it's going to be my regular co-pilot this season, uh, Spencer Holbrook, uh, smiling at you. Go ahead and smile, Spencer, and say hello to the folks. Uh, hello, folks. Uh, Tim, yeah. you got a little pep in your step there. Yeah, I got a little pep in my step, man, because college football season, well, actually started last weekend, if you count those games. I'm not sure Scott Frost would like to count those games. Uh, but the bottom line is it really kicks off for guys like me and you, Ohio State hosting Notre Dame September 3rd in the Horseshoe, the Ohio Stadium, 100th, 100th anniversary of the Ohio Stadium. Uh, it's gonna be They're going to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the 2002 National Championship team, uh, Ohio State. And of course, the night the first national championship in Ohio State history was 1942. This would be the what the the 80th year anniversary of that. But I'm not sure there's anybody there to, to celebrate that except uh, kin folks. But uh, boy, the twos the twos kind of have it uh, to a certain extent when it comes to Ohio State history, don't they, Spencer? Uh, yeah, and you wonder if that could be a precursor for things to come for this team. They've certainly got the talent to do so. So. You know, maybe the twos are, are what we're looking for, Tim. They could it didn't happen in the zeros. It couldn't happen last year in the ones. Maybe the twos is the secret sauce. Yeah, 2012. Uh, Urban Meyer takes over an improbable undefeated season. Of course, they couldn't go to a bowl game or to the to the to the to the, to the uh, BCS game of that year. But uh, still, um, a remarkable season in its own right. Coming back from uh, six and seven to go uh, twelve and zero in the first year under Urban Meyer. And of course, I have my Urban Meyer. Uh, mini podcast I'm calling it the uh, Urban's Take in the middle of the week each week now and uh, appreciate you helping me with that Spencer but you know it's boy football season is just revving up and I do get fired up I do have a change of a change of whatever you want to call it demeanor uh, going into college football season every year I have since I was like five or six years old I don't deny it I'm not ashamed of it how about yourself yeah I made sure to get in some time with my family some time with the in-laws took my fiance on a date made sure we got all that under control just because you know after this after this past weekend it's kind of like hey 14 of the next 15 or however long uh you know there's there's a little bit different tone coming into the weekend every weekend you got to be prepared so yeah uh, i'm hydrating in preparation for this marathon tim i make sure to eat the carbs for the preparation for it i think we're ready to run it I was gonna say, man, maybe you're taking it a little bit too to the edge, but uh, <laughs> but you do work your rear end off. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm not saying that I know it for a fact. And you know, I've got uh, Jim Trussell coming on here in a few minutes. We're going to discuss that 2002 national championship season and a lot of other things with Jim Trussell, uh, the Youngstown State University uh, president, who's going to be ending that tenure in February after an eight and a half year run. And of course, you remember his run as the Ohio State University uh, head football coach, a 10-year run that basically rebuilt the snowball, you know, from one of another term. And it's been rolling almost downhill since then. I think you agree with that, don't you, Spencer? Absolutely. Absolutely. And when you you look back at, you know, the 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 Cooper to Trestle transition, you look back at the, the Trestle to Meyer one-year gap transition, you know, this uh, Urban Meyer to Ryan Day, None of that can happen without the Cooper to Trestle transition, Trestle's ability to put everything together for a 2002 run that was as impressive of a national championship as I think you'll see. I don't know if you'll see another one like it ever again in college football because that team was so driven by its defense, so driven by uh, you know its running game, two things that just aren't as important or as emphasized anymore. And it, it's, it's a credit to what Trestle was able to do with the program to, to get it in the right direction to beat Michigan in a time where that was the big bugaboo for so long and, and to get that, get over the hump against an all-time great Miami team. I mean, uh, I don't think Jim Trestle and that team get near enough credit in the college football landscape than they should. Agreed. And he and I get into that a little bit, but you know, like you just said, uh, you named all those things, but it also was a magic season because so many things happened that could have derailed that, that ridiculous run, that undefeated run, you know, the ended up with the first overtime game in Ohio State history, followed a couple of games later by the second overtime game, which was the national championship win over Miami in the Fiesta Bowl, the BCS era. And uh, really interesting how that year went along, but Ohio State found a way to win under the guidance on field in clutch situations by Craig Krenzel. And then right on down the line, the emergence of Maurice Claret. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to quit talking about it and let's just get to my conversation with Jim Trussell, the head coach of the Ohio State Buckeyes from 2001 to sort of the 
unceremonial end there after the 2010 season. Here's my conversation. That's promise, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I've got Jim Trussell uh, on this podcast. This is a very special time for a lot of reasons uh, in Ohio State football history. It seems like the twos, man, the twos, the years of the twos had big moments uh, running up through the years, but maybe none were as, I don't know, as impactful is the word that my, my friend Jim Trussell would use is that 2002 National Championship, which really shook down the echoes again, brought down the thunder in Ohio Stadium and, and, and in Buckeye Nation. So, Jim Trussell, thanks for joining me on the Tim May Podcast again, my man. Well, thanks so much, Tim. It, that that was a fun year, and, and uh, I was just telling someone recently that, uh, you know, when you get a little older, you reflect a little bit, and it's been so much fun to, to watch, uh, you know, what – that moment did and has helped us do here the the next 20 years in Ohio State football. I, it's it's been it's been uh, a blessing to be uh, a part of it. I was going to say, you know, as you like you said, as you reflect back on it, uh, 2001, you beat Michigan uh, as promised, uh, but 2002, that really was the snowball that started this 20 year run. It wasn't. It? I mean, when you really think about it, and and. I mean, as you look back, as you say you reflect, how improbable, just, you know, before we get to kind of the nuts and bolts, and we're not going to get deep into that because we've reflected on that a million, million times, but how improbable, as you look back on it, what you were thinking in August of that year, if you can remember that far back, uh, I know I have trouble, <laughs> but uh, how improbable did that turn out to be the more you think about what you thought about your team in August of that year? Well, you know, in August, we were thinking about getting better in August. And remember, we had that early August game, the, the what they call it, kickoff classic yeah. back then. And, and uh, you know, we took that as a blessing that we got to play an extra game so we could come in a little earlier and get to know one another a little better. And, and uh, uh, so we weren't thinking about what that would end. I know some of the guys – uh, love talking about we're going to be national champions and and we never apologized for that being a goal but uh, what I thought they did a great job of was uh, every day in August and every day in September trying to figure out how they could get a little bit better and and uh, you know as you know better than anyone it wasn't like we rolled the table <laughs> it was a battle every week but you know the hardest things uh, in life are the ones that make you better. Uh, you know, we've all experienced those professionally, personally, whatever it happens to be the toughest things teach you the best lessons. And, and, uh, that 2002 year, uh, we had a lot of tough lessons, uh, but fortunately they were lessons learned in victory. Sometimes you learn tough lessons in defeat, but, uh, you know, that, that one was one that, uh, was fun to watch. Yeah, I was going to say that. That's an old line. You 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 learn more from a loss than a win. But no, I think you learn more from a close win than you. You know what I mean? Because because you you figured out a way to pull it out, which tells you so much about your football team. And you know the one. And I'm not going to go game for game, but uh, there there's always a linchpin. The linchpin to me was hanging on in Paul Brown Stadium in Cincinnati, the Geno Gadouli day. You know, University of Cincinnati. You know, we're playing without Maurice Claret, uh, just sort of hamstrung occasionally offensively. Seeing like, but boy, Craig Prinzel delivered some just gut plays at quarterback. I mean, talking about running as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. And then the defense comes up with that great play at the end of the game where they had four shots into the end zone, dropped a pass. But, I mean, you don't get to where you ended up without that one, right? I mean, you understand what I'm saying? Because that, that could have turned that whole season the, the wrong direction, right? Well, there's no question. I think if when you go back and chronicle a lot of seasons, you know, you can turn to some points that uh, it could have gone a different direction. And, and you know, we had played so well uh, against Texas Tech, and I can't remember who was next, maybe Kent or somebody. And, yeah, Washington and, uh, State. Yeah. And then Washington State, who was a very good team. Yes. And and they were they ended up in the Rose Bowl. Yeah. And uh, so we played really well. And, you know, like can happen, uh, sometimes you – you take a deep breath and relax. And in college football, uh, you, you know, especially at that time, um, the parody was anybody could beat you. And, really? uh, yeah. you know, so we were fortunate, uh, but 
as you pointed out, uh, guys did make some unbelievable play. I mean, think of the one Krenzel was like flipped upside down or something on that one run. Uh, But he was going, even though we weren't playing wonderfully, he was going to make sure we didn't lose. Yeah. And and that's kind of what is the mark of a great team. Yeah. I've told him several times, he's as clutch a quarterback. You know, Mm -hmm. you know, there were plays in between sometimes end up meaning you have to be clutch, you know, (laughs) But he was as clutch a quarterback as I think I've covered at Ohio State. And that's a lot of guys. Uh, that's not knocking anybody else down. But I think that's what emerged as that year went on because it was about Maurice Claret to begin with. And then it was about after he started getting banged up, it was about just hanging on in some of those re- in some of those contests, right? And, and having a quarterback that just didn't make the big mistake but didn't make a play to win the game. I, you agree? Yeah, there's no doubt. You know, the thing that Craig had um, on the offensive side, and and I think a guy like Doss had on the defensive yeah. side, and Will Smith, and I mean, you, there's a lot of them, but particularly they just had that confidence that they were not going to let us lose. And just Craig, you know, I tease him all the time. I said, you know, he probably thought he was better than he was, but you know what? He was the best. Yeah, you know he, he was the very best, and it was because he believed he was, and and it, it's a great lesson for people, you know, whether they're playing sports or doing anything else. Uh, if they have the confidence and they're willing to lay it out on the line like he did, uh, you know, the number of times you know he got banged around and and made spectacular things happen, and I always love the the uh, trivia question: Who was the leading rusher in the championship game? Was it McGahey? Was it Claret? Or was it Krenzel? And, you know, it was Krenzel yeah. in, in the big game. Yes. Yeah. He just he just delivered. And, you know, right on down the line, holy Buckeye against uh, Purdue, the pass, the pass play. You know, I keep reminding people I, the way I understood that play, uh, uh, probably Hartsock or Gamble might have been the first, you know, the first reads for Craig. But Craig had to step by pressure. And then obviously he looks up and here's Jenkins one-on-one. Who doesn't take that shot, right? I mean – you're a former quarterback, uh, but did, do you still get goosebumps when you think about that particular play, for example? Well, thank goodness he he saw that because Ben was covered. Yep. Both the backs who could have been checked downs had to block. Uh, Chris ran the wrong route. <laughs> and so there was only one guy left. Yep. And, uh, and and Craig was under duress, but he, he wasn't going to let us lose. And, and that's, uh, you know, that's and that's what's hard about when people start making comparisons about this person and that person. And they say, well, let's look at these statistics and so forth. Uh, the ones that you can't measure uh, are the ones that uh, are pretty special. And and, uh, you know, all the way from the last game, last regular season game of 01, really through the 2003 season, uh, he just. His, his thing was, we're not going to lose. Yeah. And, uh, you know, his, his final game, the uh, Kansas State uh, Fiesta Bowl, you know, I was a little concerned because, you know, we lost to Michigan. And, and I think, unfortunately, we may have been thinking about, well, if we beat Michigan, we're going to the championship again. And that's just what we do here. Yeah. And uh, that didn't happen. I thought, ooh, I wonder, you know, what this is going to be like. And we had a lot of guys that were – Everyone knew they were heading to the NFL. And uh, so might we start thinking about other things? And I'll never forget Will Smith standing up in front of the team before bowl practice started. And he said, I'm not leaving Ohio State losing two straight. And so you all better practice that way. Yeah. And that's the way Craig was. That's the way Will was. And, and uh, those are special guys to be around. Oh, yeah. The late Will Smith, man. One of the oh, – just amazing. His son's going to be a Buckeye here in a year. And uh, yeah. it's just, it, wow, I, I just got goosebumps there because he's one of the more solid individuals I have yeah. ever met. Yeah. One of the most trustworthy uh, and responsible guys. I mean, we're, you know, right on down the line. And of course, in 2002, you know, Chris Gamble, I still don't think he's gotten his just due. Oh. You know, just a, I mean, no a finally, I mean, a guy that, a, a guy that made it so you couldn't take him off the field, <laughs> yep. really, on offense or defense. It, it was crazy how that escalated, wasn't it? 
Well, it really was. In fact, I was just texting with Chris the other day and because all the guys are urging him to come back. And I, I text him. I said, Chris, we wouldn't be having this celebration. Yeah. If it yeah. weren't for you, you know, and, and I, I still to this moment don't know if his schedule is going to allow him to be back. Uh, you know, Chris, he's not a limelight guy. He's not nope. a pat me on the back guy. Uh, and but oh, there's no question like anything else. Uh, as you know, Tim, you're a student of history, and, and history is the, is the study of complex design of how things ended up happening. Yeah. You know, whether it's, you know, world history or American history or Ohio State football history. And if you think about the complex design that created that 2002 uh, opportunity for us to just take off as a program, uh, it, it was complex. Yes. Without a doubt. I mean, it was melding old and new. You know what I mean? No, guys, absolutely. carryovers from the from yeah. the John Cooper era, but you know, and but then also the new guys. I mean, you know, yeah. Maurice was a was a was a obviously a major a part of that of that push. Maurice Corrette and stuff. But then, you know, you look up who scores the winning touchdown in overtime against Illinois. Maurice Hall. Right. Who scores right. the winning touchdown against Michigan? Maurice Hall. You know, yeah. because these pieces stepped up when they needed to, and. Uh, yeah. You know, like I said, holy Buckeye, Illinois. Oh my goodness. Overtime, first overtime game in Ohio State history. You're not sitting there on the sideline going, hey, we got this, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, it's that's right. It, this was watching somebody climb up a, a sand hill. You take two steps up and slide one down sometimes, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's no but, question. Did, what do you remember about that game in particular, though? Because was there a little bit of a peek ahead, do you think, by your team to the next week? Or what, what just what do you remember? You know, I first of all, it's tough to win on the road yeah. against tough teams in the Big Ten, and and I think especially in that era, I think uh, you know the parity was uh, was was pretty was pretty tough, and and uh, you know I we had gone a long grind, and you know the when you keep winning, you know the the burden gets a little heavier for young people, and people are banged up. You know, and, and I remember Craig making a crazy run that game. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. He made a couple. Man. Yeah. I mean, it was like, I mean, uh, so, you know, we were just in the middle of, of the journey. It was just a bang. And and uh, I don't even remember if Maurice played at all. No, he, he did not play, but he lobbied to play all through yeah. the second half. He was standing behind you. It was crazy. <laughs> go ahead, though. I'm sorry. But so, you know, I mean, it, it was a battle. You know, every time you go over there. Uh, it's a battle, you know, whether the wind is going to blow you away or whatever. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what, that's what I wanted to say. I mean, you could you could wake up on a Saturday morning there. It could be the nicest day in history. But usually the wind's going to be coming. That was a wind tunnel. And the wind tunnel had a huge effect on that game. I mean, you got yeah. Mike Duchin had missed a field goal all year until he misses one in that game into the wind. You know, it's yeah. it was crazy, right? It's kind, of, it kind of like one of those things where, oh, okay, now it's catching up to us, right? <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, but that that speaks to the tenacity of those kids, you know, and, yes. and uh, you know, they just uh, they were grinding, they were tired, they were beat up, they were, uh, you know, listening to all the uh, people, you know, expecting them to keep win and winning and 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 uh, you know, so it was uh, it, it was it was a fun time, and and I can tell you that. After the final, final game, I'm sure our guys slept for, oh. you know, in fact, it was funny. I was talking with someone about the playoff thing and so forth. And I said, you know, I'm not sure either Miami or Ohio State could have played the next week. Yeah. Yeah. You and I, you and I talked about that. Uh, I did yeah. a story on that because it's like it was such a just a ridiculous physical game. Obviously, Willis McGahee, yeah. you know. Uh, God bless him. Uh, but, uh, you know, the Will Allen hit on him, but, but just right on down the line, you just go, now you got to play another game with the same intensity. That's, right. that's nuts. Right. And this idea, we'll get into that just real quick. Cause I want to get your input on that, but real quickly, Michigan, Will Allen intercepts the ball at the one yard on the final play. That wasn't a cakewalk either. They were throwing no. to the end zone, you know, the final play. They were Boom, a good they football the team. Desert. Yeah. Oh, I, don't, I don't, I don't know what they were ranked at the time, but they were pretty good. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. uh, and that game, you know, it doesn't matter where you're yeah. ranked. And, and uh, so, oh, no, there's – there's, but, again, that difficulty of that challenge uh, 
just build us a little stronger. And then fortunately, we had a little time to heal up and, and mentally, you know, get on the right track. And, and uh, uh, you know, it, it, uh, every single one of those games that year had their contribution to the whole. Yeah. Six, you had like, what, six weeks almost till you played in the Fiesta Bowl, the BCS National Championship game. And uh, and I've held this this question back until now, as far as in this conversation, you know, I got asked before that game, and I picked you guys everywhere. It felt like me picking Buster Douglas, you know, <laughs> to beat Mike Tyson. But uh, but it really felt like that. But I thought the thing that was so being discounted in that game, and I even said it on on many TV and radio stations around the country, and even wrote it. Your your defense was totally underrated. I mean that. Right. That defense, oh my goodness, just the slobber knocker approach of that defense. Matt Wilhelm there in the mirror in the middle, Mike Doss, and then Chris Gamble coming on at the corner, and then of course Will Smith, Darian Scott, those guys up front, Tim Anderson. Yeah. Uh, you could name a Simon Frazier, you know, was I think a freshman or whatever he was. Grants, you know, I mean, yeah. yes. and we had some depth, you know, AJ Hawk was now a sophomore, yeah. really, because yeah. we, were, we were in game 14. Yes, you know, exactly. You know, he was I, into his second realm. That's and, right. Uh, but just did did you do you agree with me that that at the end of the year that that defense maybe before that game that I'm talking about against Miami it didn't get its shrift. In fact, that's the correct term that it was sort of like looked over. And it was because we were all focused on, of course, the Maurice Claret episode out there, sure, sure. and also uh, Craig Grinzel to Michael Jenkins. Why wouldn't you be? I mean, mm-hmm. one of the clutch combos in history. Right. college football. Do you think the defense got its uh, just due until after that game? You understand what I'm saying? Oh, there's no question. And 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 the way that the defense and the offense and the special teams complemented one yes. another, you know, and, and uh, believed in one another. And, and But I could tell on that first or second series that Miami's offensive line didn't have any idea mentally – what they were going to be facing. And it, it's hard to change your, you can't flip a switch and say, Oh, okay. Now I know what we're facing. You had to be thinking about that for 43 days. Yes. And that was our advantage. And again, you study the complex design of history. Uh, you know, we had the advantage that everybody in America knew how good Miami was. And so did we, yeah. and we prepared accordingly. Yeah. I don't know for sure that Miami knew that we were pretty good, but what, they went 34 straight games, uh, hadn't had that many tough ones uh, and hadn't faced someone like us uh, that that played the similar style. And, and so when I saw the way that our defensive front was flying around, uh, I thought, you know, we have a chance. Now that's the good news. The bad news is, is their defense, their defense, Miami's defense was as good as advertised. I mean, yes. we were going to have to scratch for every inch we could get. And, and uh, that's why, you know, one of the dumb calls in history will go down in my fake field goal call, you know, that was unsuccessful. But, you know, we went into the game thinking that we're going to have to come up with ways to, to uh, manufacture yards, first downs and points against this team because they are as advertised. Yeah. Hey, Jim, I wonder, I've never, I don't think I've ever asked you this, but I've always thought that where, where you were underrated and underrated uh, just if you study, uh, you know, because we'd get on you guys for being a little conservative playing trussle ball. You know what I mean? But you didn't play trussle ball against Michigan. I mean, you come out, I think in 2002, even looked like, I mean, everybody's modern day spread offense. You're, you're, you're out there in a spread offense. I mean, you know what I mean? You're getting after it. Uh, do you, did you consciously just save stuff uh, for, for when you needed it, for the right moments to really sort of like let it all hang out? I mean, just as you look back on it. Well, you know, I think one of the secrets to, to being uh, sustaining excellence is to make sure that you're in concert with all the phases of your game. And, and the minute we start saying, well, I'm going to worry about how many yards we get, you know, or, or yeah. that kind of thing. Uh, all of a sudden you've broken from the hole. Uh, 
And, and I'm not sure that we necessarily, we, we did save things a little bit and, and only from a standpoint of, we felt we needed to practice them for two or three weeks because when you're going against good teams, it's not like you can, Oh, I got an idea. You know, and, and we're going to try this against Michigan or we're yeah. going to try this against works. Miami, yeah. you know, but uh, some things that you were working on and we always liked to test them against our guys a little bit, you know, and, and uh, you know, just see where ooh, maybe we had to block this a little differently or, you know, do this a little differently, but uh, there's an evolution, um, you know, to every season and, and, uh, but you know, you remember the folklore that allegedly Woody would practice a little bit each week and save things for Michigan. You know, we didn't do that. I mean, yeah, yeah. we didn't say in September, hey, we're going to start practicing this for Michigan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you got Washington State sitting there. I mean, what right. The heck, right? right. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. I yeah. mean, that, uh, yeah, exactly right. Uh, you know, but I thought that uh, 2002 team was definitely a great example of that old, the cliche iron sharpens iron because mm -hmm. you had a, an offensive line that just developed. You know, right in front of your eyes there. Uh, and then, of course, a defensive line headed by Will Smith. Oh, my goodness, that's iron. You know, that's going against iron and stuff in, in, in practice situations when you would go good against good occasionally. But uh, uh, Rip, that, that's one of the saddest things that really going into this reunion weekend is yeah. that, you know, you went in the trenches and, you know, Ivan Douglas and Shane Olivier and Will Smith, you know, don't get to be – with us uh, physically, uh, they get to be with us in spirit. But uh, you know, you think how time flies and how the world changes, and and uh, you know those types of things. Uh, when you do think of our teams, you think about uh, you know being good in the trenches, and uh, yeah, uh, we're sure going to miss those guys uh, oh. next weekend. Yeah, all three of those guys had a tremendous had a tremendous story behind them. You know, just. And just to, to rise to the occasion as a group, uh, as a part of a band, I mean, yeah, uh, RIP, rest in peace, but all three of those fellas. Yeah. Uh, the championship game, uh, I'm not going to relive moment by moment. There were two plays that stood out. Uh, Ten-year anniversary, you and I talked about this. Uh, the pass to the sideline that would have run out the clock if we'd had instant replay back then, yes, that game right. would have been over in game regulation, over. right? Yeah. 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 And it, But you know what? the football gods are good too, because winning it in two overtimes even made it yeah. more of an impact. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. so while, while I was disappointed at that moment, and then when we punted and the guy ran it back, I was real disappointed. Yeah. But uh, as it turned out, uh, wouldn't you rather win it in two overtimes in terms of how history is written? Uh Matt Wilhelm once told me, as told me several times actually, but once right after that game told me he got one finger on that field goal, on that Seabird's field goal. So his longest field goal of his career at that moment, right. 39 yards. He yeah. said, if I'd gotten two, we'd have won the game in regulation. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, yeah. that's what football is all about, right? That's but, right. Dude, as you, as you look back 20 years away, was the holding or pass interference call in the end zone legit from your standpoint? Then? Well, you know, I, I thought he got mugged on this just on exactly. the line of scrimmage. Exactly. So whether it's pass interference or defensive holding, same, same thing. Yeah. Uh, and it, but I guess the amount of time till the flag came out was the the real disconcerting thing. It's like I mean, you know, they're going to let him mug our receiver just like that, you know. Yeah. And and yeah. Uh, but anyway, that's. Uh, that, again, part of the, the thrill of the history. What bothered me, though, was the official right there standing, I think it was the head linesman or the line judge, standing right there, watched it happen, and right. didn't do a thing. And right. Terry Porter comes out of the corner. He threw his flag, I think, quicker than most people. That's kind of gone into folklore a little bit. He right. threw his flag maybe a little quicker than some people thought, but uh, but he comes out, and first he makes like a holding call, and then he does an interference call. They, yeah. I'm going, well, that's double. You know, they should get 30 yards on this one. No, but – uh. But yep. the problem was the fireworks went off, you know. Right. That, right. that was whoever ran up there and shut the firework fuse down, man. I got you got to give that guy credit, right? But well, you know what's what's funny is is I, I don't know, funny if it's the right word, but still when you run into people from Miami, that's what they want to talk about. Oh, which yeah. which I get. But you know, 
sometimes you got to stop talking about that. And I'm not sure that their direction program wise uh, I, for the last 20 years, I'm not sure they've been in the elite. Have they no. since, since that night? No. And, and part of it, and that's just a good reminder to all of us, you know, sometimes stuff happens and you got to learn from it. And we used to tell our team all the time, we have got to win so decisively that there's no way the officials can impact the game. Yeah. Just like and, a boxing match. Yeah. And, and that's the same boxing match or, or life, right? Yeah. Yes. You got to you got to keep trudging forward regardless of, of the call, whether you agreed with it or not, or you're just going to wallow uh, for perpetuity. All right. Let's get some more, a few things that I'm kicking up too much of your time here because you're a president of Youngstown State University. You're going to be stepping away in February uh, after eight and a half years. I mean, I mean, you took one career and then turned it into another career. Obviously, you had that little moment in between. Uh, by the way, I want to ask you, do you ever regret anything that happened during that moment in between? The, the, is there anything you think, uh, even almost daily, if I'd have done this, this wouldn't have happened, or if we had done this, it wouldn't have happened, or if NIL had come along, <laughs> this wouldn't have happened. Did, you know, does it, does it bug you a little bit? You know, I, I wouldn't say it bugs me a little bit um, because, you know, just like – Miami needed to, after the call uh, was made, you know, they needed to get ready for 2003. You know, yeah. that's just the way life is. Uh, you know, when calls are made, decisions are made, uh, you learn from them. If you don't go back and learn from them, you know, shame on you. Uh, but, you, you know, to think that I had a chance to be a college president uh, and uh, I remember, you remember old Doc Spurgeon, my old oh, yeah. English professor, yeah. he just passed away, unfortunately, at age 93. And, and I remember shortly after uh, leaving Ohio State, and he told me, he said, you do know that your greatest impact is ahead of you. Now, I was not feeling that way. Yeah. Believe me, I'm thinking, wait a minute, I'm an Ohio boy that was at Ohio State. No, I, I, I can't. I'm having a hard time saying that that's going to happen. He said, no, let me repeat. Your greatest impact is ahead of you if you believe it. Yeah. Wow. Wow. You have to believe that it will be and go out and make it that way. And, and that's, that's what you have to do as time goes on. So you don't have time to be bothered by this or that or, or say, oh, boy, I wish there was NIL or, or hey, I told you. So back 20 years ago that, you know, we weren't treating the student athletes right or 50 yeah. years ago. I mean, you, you know, whatever you fought, you know, you're doing whatever the rules are. You do the rules and you live and die by the rules. And and uh, but uh, so, you know, I, I spent all of my time trying to figure out if I could make that come true, that, uh, you know, even a wider impact uh, might be ahead of me. You know, Ellen told me um, when I did a story and you first got named the head coach at Ohio State, she said, you know, one of the things that stood out to her and she admired about you, uh, yes, your wife admired you, uh, that you want to impact young people, as many young people as you can. And, yep. and it really stepping into the president president uh, room at Youngstown State allowed you to take it to the masses, right, instead of 110 faces looking at it. Now, let's face it. When you win big time games at Ohio State, you impact more than those 110. <laughs> you know, you right. give life and hope and dreams to you know millions around Ohio and Buckeye Nation. But but that has this 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 turn you took, this why you took in the road, has finally allowed you to do that, right? To take sort of your the message that you taught these players to like 10, 15, 20 thousand people at a time at Youngstown State, right? Oh, there's no question that you. When you take the why in the road, you got to go on that why, yeah. you know, and, and it, it's pardon, hey, pardon that pun. You I know. Me. How about that? That was that was strong. In fact, I should have used that for the last eight and a half years. <laughs> yeah, you should have. <laughs> but but there's no doubt. And, and, you know, you wake up every day seeing who you can serve and who you can impact. And and uh, it's a little broader scope. Now, there was a lot of learning curve in it. And there was a lot of ups and downs, just like in coaching and so forth. And and, uh, you know, it's. Uh, 
I tell people all the time that, uh, of course, many of our championships or big game wins or stuff were, were uh, meaningful. Uh, you know, what we've been doing the last eight and a half years has been as personally meaningful, you know, as, as any of those. And, and uh, you know, so I've, I've been very, very blessed. This is my 48th year in higher ed. And, uh, you know, I've been blessed to, to be around a lot of good young people. Man, I'm just thinking about what that what that means for you in a pension situation. Much, much less. Uh, That's right. Uh, hey, you know, you, you're one of those great guys who basically teaches a lesson. Pride comes before the fall and stuff. But as you look back on it now, you're almost done. Uh, you know, at least from who knows where you're going to go after February. So I may I may be putting it. But when you look back on it, just football wise, are you proud of what you and your staff? I mean, what a what a coaching staff that was. You know, with Dino. Mark D'Antonio is your defensive coordinator and right on down the line uh, that turned things around. You know, like, you know, you're the first to say, I think you agree, you inherited some pretty good talent at Ohio State. Absolutely. You got your John Cooper, John Cooper just, you know, he's like Moses. He got him almost to the brink of the promised land, but didn't didn't take him in, you know. And, uh, you know, second wing is coach in Ohio State history. You can't discount that about John Cooper. Uh, right. But but are you, are you as you look back on it now and you touched on it at, at the beginning, 2002 marked the beginning of just a tremendous ride, re-rise in, in Ohio State football, which has continued almost unabated uh, or uninterrupted. It, it, what 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 just came together there that you still seeing paying fruit, uh, uh, paying off in dividends for Ohio State, uh, Jim? Well, like anyone that's a, a part of a relay, and we're all a part of a relay, right? And when you're handed the baton, you know, can you can you uh, make where we are in the race better? And that, that's what that's what you do. Yeah. And I'm real proud of the way that uh, our staff and everyone. I mean, I don't care if it's the trainers or the uh, you, you name them, uh, every single player. Uh, you know, when it was their turn to run the leg of the relay, uh, they they helped Ohio State's fortunes in this long race. And, you know, it never ends. Right. Yeah, that relay race never ends, and uh, our leg of the race, I'm very proud of. But dude, you took the tradition and honor of the place. I thought to a different level. You don't know this. I even wrote a story about this later after I saw. But I'm walking behind you, leaving the practice field one time, and there was a piece of trash laying in the Woody Hayes Athletic Center, and I watched you just nonchalantly lean down, pick it up, stick it in your pocket, and keep walking. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. you know, the place meant something to you. The, the singing of Carmen, Ohio, after the end of games, win or lose, which is tough to do when you're losing right? I mean, after a loss and stuff, but it didn't happen very often. <laughs> but that those are – but just the taking care of the way as a flex center, taking care of the tradition and stuff, why was that so important to you? Well, on the front of our winner's manual every year was with tradition comes responsibility. And we took very seriously our responsibility to – to be the head coach at Ohio State for 10 years, I mean, how many people get that opportunity? Well, there's a big responsibility that goes with that. To be an assistant coach at Ohio State, to be a trainer at Ohio State, to play in the band at Ohio State, to, you know, whatever it is you do at Ohio State, there's a responsibility. And uh, and I, I think the same thing is true while we're here on earth, right? Yeah. You no. Know? Hey, if, if they give me – I'm going to be 70 here pretty quick. So if I get to 70, they gave me 70 years, you know, to see if I could uphold the tradition of our civilization. And uh, it just, you know, to me, that's what you do. Hey, uh, last two things. Uh, name, image, and likeness. What, what do you think about the melding of name, image, and likeness with the transfer portal? Are you concerned about where college football is going? Or when you're the NCAA, and the NCAA is Ohio State, it is all the member institutions. But when you kick the can down the street about remuneration for players or maybe sharing a little bit in the large yes, this is kind of what happens, right? I mean, you, you end up with a chaotic almost situation. Uh, but just I know, you've, I know you've thought about it. Just what, what are just your general thoughts about where we are right now in that realm and, and, and in upholding those traditions? of major college football, of players just sticking around more than one or two years in a place where they decide to go somewhere else, et cetera. But I know that's about six questions in one, but you know how I go, right? Well, you know, I think like anything, 
uh, the situation you find yourself in, you probably put yourself there. And, and so we put ourselves there. Yeah. And so here's where we are. And whether it's we're two and three, we put ourselves there, you know, and so what are we going to do about it? Yeah. Um, and so it's going to be interesting to see how uh, we handle this situation. I think it's a tough one. I, I feel for the coaches uh, because they're inheriting a situation where for decades and decades and decades as revenue and exposure and money and everything grew, uh, the student athletes you know, didn't share in it uh, to the degree perhaps they deserved. Uh, and all of a sudden the bomb exploded and the horse is out of the barn. And so how are we going to handle trying to see if we can get the horse back to the barn and it'll be a different barn, yeah. it'll be a different way. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's what, you know, that's what you need leadership for. That's what, um, you know, hopefully good decisions will be made. Um, and it's going to be interesting to watch. Um, uh, I feel for these coaches, you know, because they, uh, I know they want to build young men and so forth. Well, it's hard when they transfer you know, if they're not playing or, or, you know, and I think of the lessons learned by some of the kids that I had transfer in here at Youngstown state that had to sit a year yeah. and they had to reflect and they had yeah. to think about how they put themselves in that situation and how could they earn their way into the, to the team that was already here and those kinds of things. And, and the values of sport uh, are through some of those very, very difficult things, but it doesn't mean you don't deserve some of the, some of the spoils. And so we're going to have to find out the way. Uh, uh, I'm an optimist in that uh, usually when you're thrust against it, uh, eventually you find your way out. And uh, I guess it'll be stay tuned because uh, it won't be without some challenging and, and uh, difficult times. Absolutely. Uh Last thing, but it's kind of a convoluted question. In 2005, you guys uh, didn't get to the BCS, one of those few times during those mid-2000s. Uh, you end up playing a team called Notre Dame uh, in the Fiesta Bowl. You guys win the game decisively. That was a Charlie Weiss-led Notre Dame uh, with Brady Quinn, a Dublin native who y'all tried to recruit. <laughs> what bought right on down the line. Bottom line is, just before you took the podium in the postgame press conference, I walked up to you and I said, wait a minute, I said, now, if Charlie Weiss is supposed to be a genius in football, what does that make you? <laughs> and you said, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but uh, just number one, just what I want to get your your thoughts on Ryan Day and what he is like put together now, taking over from Urban Meyer, who took the ball and ran with it, obviously, took it to another level. And then Ryan Day seems to be doing that on a recruiting front. But number one, what's your what's your take on the job he's doing? And then number two, just you know, you're a family. I don't know if you still do this, and I used to have your family reunions. I think it's South Bend. I remember some kind of story like that yeah. you and I talked about. Uh, because wow, you know, Notre Dame, Notre Dame's cool, right? You know, but maybe second coolest in your mind. But uh, kind of a convoluted last question. But here is Ohio State opening uh, you know, this twenty twenty two season. Top five opponent, Notre Dame. Uh, Number one, are you even excited about it? I know you're rooting for the Penguins, but are you even excited about it? And number two, what is just your take on where Ryan Day has gotten taken this program maybe to another height? I mean, what's just your take on that, Jim? Well, I, I've been impressed and pleased, and it's been fun to get to know Ryan. I think he's a quality guy. I think he uh, wants to do things on the on the best interest of the students. Yeah. Uh, he wants to – to grow, to learn more and more uh, about what Ohio State is all about. And, and he's immersed himself in that. And, and, uh, and he's done a wonderful job recruiting. And, and uh, uh, you know, I think that uh, as I was with him just last Saturday night, uh, yeah. you know, he, he's got a laser focus on this game one because he doesn't feel good about, you know, the way that the season ended last year. And, and, uh, and I've been there, done that. I mean, you, you can't even not think about it all day long. And so I'm excited for him. You know, obviously I'm excited for Marcus Freeman and who's, who's a guy that, uh, you know, uh, has been given a great responsibility with that great tradition. And, and uh, um, 
you know, I think in both their cases, I think the world can't end on that game. Uh, you know, someone's going to lose the game. Someone's going to win the game. Both of them are going to play next week, you know, yeah. and, and both of them are going to have to continue to keep building what they're doing. But those are two bright young guys. I I'm a, I'm a Ryan day fan and, and, uh, uh, it, it's fun to watch. It's, it's fun to see Brian Hartline. I'm going to have knuckleheads like Hartline Freeman and Lauren Itis going against each other. And I yeah. used to watch them battle on the practice field. That's crazy yeah. for you though. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, well, yeah. you know, think, talk about that, but Marcus Freeman, what an opportunity, right? And wow. But what a responsibility. I mean, right. crazy, yeah. right? No, it really is. And, and, I think he's got the the kind of temperament and the kind of humble nature that uh, he'll handle it. Now it won't be, you know, all, you know, great days. It just isn't, but you know, Ryan is going to handle Ohio state just tremendously, but it won't be all perfect days, you know? And and, uh, that's just, uh, I, I tell people at places like Ohio state or Michigan or USC or Notre Dame, one thing that you need to go to know going in, it is impossible to win enough. Yeah. That can't be done. Yeah. And so go be the best you can be and, and, you know, make sure you're growing those kids so that when they're 35, those are your victories is what are they doing when they're 35, yeah. you know? And, and, uh, but in the meantime, have fun competing like mad because I'm going to win all the games now. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Trussell, the incomparable Jim Trussell. Uh, boy, when everybody anybody sits down, like my buddy Jeff Snook or somebody sits down and writes your final book, man. I mean, it, maybe not final book, but that's going to be a must read, don't you think? You you got me painted as being pretty old. My final start talking about my final. I know book. I, I, I slipped. Yeah, I didn't know if you saw me <laughs> slip or I tried to catch myself before I ran out of bounds, but I didn't quite do it. Jim uh, Trussell, thanks for joining the Tim May podcast again, my man. Yes, sir. My honor. You know, Tim, the national title game that season, I don't want to make you feel old, but the national title game, I was I was six. It's my first college football memory. It's really cool. Um, just just thinking back to uh, we, we had a party at one of my family members' house. We come down the stairs, and everybody's going nuts because uh, Claret stripped the ball back from Sean Taylor, and all of a sudden, Dad's got me in front of the TV making sure that I'm witnessing the yeah. first national championship in 30 years at Ohio State. And I, it's a memory that I'll have forever. It's probably what got me into college football more than anything. Yeah, I think for Ohio State fans, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, uh, that's sort of like where were you when Buster Douglas knocked out uh, Mike Tyson? I think the 2002 national championship game was just like that because, as you just pointed out, Spencer, it was a microcosm, really, of the Ohio State season. They found a way. You know what I mean? They found a way. And what was underrated as that year went on, as I pointed out to to Coach Trussell a couple of times there in that interview, uh, the defense was so underrated. That's why I picked Ohio State to win that game against Miami. And everybody go, well, you always pick Ohio State. But, yeah, I felt good about that one because, uh, I mean, I just thought the, the thing that no one was talking about was Ohio State's defense. And as Jim Trussell pointed out in that interview, man, when that, when that Miami offensive line got its first taste of, like, Will Smith, Darian Scott, uh, uh, those guys on that front line, they went, wait a minute, <laughs> this isn't Wake Forest, you know? <laughs> I mean, it was that was a slobber knocker game. And, you know, I've used that game as another great example of why in this bid for, you know, to have an even more expanded college football playoff going from what you would play two extra games now, as Ohio State you know, did for the first time in 2014 to win that next national championship, you know, you might be playing three games or, you know, in some team, if you get a run on, you might play four games, as, you know, from the 12-team format or the 16-team format. You'd be playing four games if you really got something going on. That's a lot to ask, not only of a college football player, but of a college football program roster. I think you agree with me, don't you? I mean, the intensity of the physical nature of these games is off the chart. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, that Miami Ohio State game had so many pros on the field, so you can you can imagine the the toll that it took on those guys. But you even look at wait a minute, that was a slip. You meant eventual pros, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, Miami maybe current pros when they were playing. I'm not yeah. sure. We'll we'll have to watch the thirty for thirty again to make sure. Uh, but then you, you you know I even remember back 2019 on the field at the Fiesta Bowl watching Ohio State and Clemson um, it, there late in the fourth quarter. And it is just a different ballgame. And yes. the physicality 
you know, you can take Ohio State, Michigan, Ohio State, Wisconsin. Those games are very physical, uh, smash mouth kind of games. Um, but it gets heightened in that college football playoff and in that national championship setting. And uh, to ask 18, 19, 20 year olds to, to do that four times on their way to a title, that's a that's a risky proposition that college football is going to have to grasp and uh, going to have to grapple with because, you know, like I said, you know, you go against Alabama one week and, and you find a way to win that game. You've still got to turn around and, and beat Oregon the next week. Uh, you know, that, that that's not an easy task for anybody to do, let alone maybe a third or a fourth time. Yeah. All right. That's done. I mean, all hail the 2002 national championship team. And I do hope Chris Gamble makes the uh, reunion because as, as uh, Jim Trussell pointed out, he was he, uh, Chris Gamble was being a little bit reluctant about showing up, and and Jim Trussell, as you heard in the interview, there said, "Man, we don't get there probably without you." You know, how do you? Uh, he was the linchpin really of that team. Ended up playing both ways uh, in the last couple of games down down the stretch, and of course, almost every play in the national championship game. You do hope Chris Gamble makes it. One of the more under maybe not underrated, but under heralded players in Ohio state history. Agree. Absolutely. Absolutely. Chris Gamble is one of those guys that you look back and you name, you know, you, you can go back through from, you can name all those guys from the nineties that went on to become, you know, superstar NFL players. You name, you start going through the Will Smith's, the Maurice Clarets, then you get into, you know, Braxton Miller, Terrell Pryor. Nobody, Will ever, really, yeah. nobody ever really throws in the Ohio state history books. No one really, mentions Chris Gamble where he probably should be ranked yeah. as far as 21st century Buckeyes. But that guy, you don't win that game. You don't get the, you know, the, the, the pass interference. You don't get the the crazy plays from the secondary. Everything that he did in that national championship game should be considered a an incredible feat for somebody to do against yeah. that physical of a Miami team. And his interception yeah. return against Penn State, his uh, breaking up the last pass by Purdue after Holy Buckeye, Purdue had yeah. a guy kind of break open. He comes from nowhere and breaks up that pass, you know, deep down the field. I mean, just right on down the line, this guy made play after play that really mattered. Matter of fact, on Holy Buckeye, he was probably the at least the number one, maybe number two receiver. And as uh, Jim Trussell pointed out, he ran the wrong route. Ben Hartsock got jumped, and so Craig Krenzel stepped around pressure and threw a strike to Michael Jenkins into the wind at Purdue, the open end of the stadium. Boy, just – play after play. But, hey, we could talk about that forever, man. Let's jump into this. I want your answer short and sweet here now, okay? Uh, trying to keep these podcasts in and around an hour or less, you know what I mean, as as this season progresses. Uh, uh, your predecessor seemed to sort of like talk a lot, and then when you combine it with my talking a lot, boy, it was tough. You know what I'm talking about? Well, conversations can go a number of ways, Tim. Uh, I'll try to keep it short for you. Um, the conversations are always great. But well, here's where you keep this short. When I ask you this question, you give me one name. You don't name five guys as you're eliminating guys to get mm -hmm. to your guy. You just give me your one name, and then I'll give you my one name, and we'll move from there, okay? Now, exactly. one name, and you give me a little, a little explanation. But that's that's the rules we're playing by in this game we call succinctness. You Are you ready? Yes. Your breakout offensive player for Ohio State in 2022. Breakout offensive player. I'm I'm going to go unconventional and, and go with one of the tight ends. I I, I know Cade Stover is going to be on the field a lot, but I, I think Joe Royer has a chance to be a guy who is talked about a little more toward the end of the season than than at the beginning. And that's unconventional because you could go with one of the running backs, but it's Dallin Hayden. You could go with the wide receivers, but those guys are all kind of known. You know that the wide receivers are going to be good. You know Ohio State's going to be able to run the ball. Can Ohio State block and get the ball to the tight ends on checkdowns when they when when CJ Stroud needs to? When he gets to that progression, do they have a guy who can catch the ball? Kate Silver can absolutely do that, but Joe Royer can stretch it a little bit more. And the tight end is always open to him. And so Joe Royer has a chance to be a breakout guy. What was the rule when we went into this thing? You said I could give an explanation to I said an explanation, I but I said him. one guy, name one person. Name All one right. person. You started out with a guy, and everybody got everybody in Lexington, Ohio, got up at the edge of their seat, and then you backed off, and you got a guy from the Cincinnati area, right? Well, you know, from Lexington to Cincinnati, there's a lot of talent in this state. I Good point. But you know, he stay stay in the rules, man. My breakout player, guy I wrote about uh, this week. I don't know if we've run the story or not, but with the time this drops, but Emeka Egbuka, Emeka Egbuka, man, 
Everybody knows about Jackson Smith and Jigba. Everybody knows about Marvin Harrison Jr. because they know about Marvin Harrison. But Marvin Harrison Jr., that six-catch, what, three-touchdown game in the Rose Bowl, whatever it was. But Emeka Egbuka had a pretty good game there, too. Kickoff return, man. Boy, I just broke my own rule there, didn't I? You did. Anyway, yeah. but Emeka Egbuka is the guy I see breaking out. I really like this guy's upside, man. And he stays healthy. Wow. I mean, he's a big dude playing uh, – wide receiver, physical dude, and, of course, his kickoff returns. Uh, they're looking to to get that first kickoff return for a touchdown since 2010. It might even come Saturday against against the Notre Dame University. Okay, breakout defensive player, name one guy. No other names, name one guy. There's a lot of proven commodities on this defense now that everything happened last year, so I will definitely go with a guy who didn't play much last year at all. A lot of talk of who's going to play on that defensive interior, but I saw a guy start with the threes in training camp and ended up end up at the end of the month running some with the ones, Tim. There's a lot of talent in that room. I don't know what the production will look like, but Mike Hall has a chance to be a pass rush disruptor, and he's a big enough body. You might be able to trust him. You know, I'm not going to speak for Larry Johnson. He's the he's a legend for a reason. But you might be able to trust him in these running situations as well. Tyler Williams was not particularly great against the run last year. Um, if they need somebody to plug the middle there, I think Mike Hall has a chance behind all those veterans to try to make a push towards some playing time. I think Mike Hall might have a chance. See, you insinuated some names at the beginning, but you didn't name them, but then you had to slip one in there, Tyler Williams. Uh, there you go. Mine, I'm trying to, trying to, keep, my, I'm trying to keep my discipline here. Uh, Lathan Ransom. Too many guys are talking about Lathan Ransom for Lathan Ransom not to be a breakout player. And when the defensive coordinator is one of those guys talking about him, you got to figure something's going to happen. They're going to figure out some way to get him on the field. But like you and I have talked about many times, even in podcasts and, and uh, rapid reaction videos after practices, they're talking about a lot of players in that safety room. And it's hard to believe that they're, they're going to just stick with three. I don't believe they are at all. You don't either, right? Uh, no, I don't think they can. Uh, you talk about those starting three. Am I allowed to name them? Are we allowed to do that now? No, we're just we're playing this game here. We'll do that after we're done. But those you can name the starting three. Go ahead. Uh, Tanner McAllister, uh, Josh Proctor, and Ronnie Hickman, the presumed starters. I'm not going to say that they're the locks because – Yeah, I wouldn't say they're the locks. When you have a Notre Dame tight end like Michael Mayer on the field, it might be wise to have like a Court Williams or a Lathan Ransom on the field at all times to make sure that he's in check. Yeah. An American tight end there. So Lathan is really, really talented. Cam Martinez is really, really talented. Court Williams. I mean, there's six guys here that will absolutely be on the field for Ohio State at safety. You can't play all six at once, but you can play all six in the a series or in a quarter or in a game. You know what's interesting? Tedder McAllister's already gone against the mayor. In the uh, Fiesta Bowl. I mean, I thought he had a little bit of a difficult time with him on occasion from the highlights I saw. So that definitely could be the matchup to watch, or will they put something, some other big body on that guy? Because Tanner McAllister is not the biggest guy on the field, that's for sure. Okay, uh, regular season record for the Ohio State University. Regular uh, season, 12 games. 12-0, and 0, Tim. And I say that reluctantly only because it is difficult to go 12-0 and in a regular season, even for Alabama, even for Ohio State, for Georgia. This is not an easy thing to do, to be that disciplined and that skilled for, you know, three straight months to be undefeated. But if you look at the, the different traps that could be set in front of them, you know, you get Maryland with healthy wide receivers. Are they going to be healthy at the end of the year when you go to Maryland? I don't know. Uh, you get Iowa and Wisconsin – in the middle of that slate, they don't seem like like they can keep up offensively with Ohio State. And then I'm not even going to start talking about uh, the rivalry at the end of November where all the trash talk that's happened. I can't even fathom Ryan Day losing two straight after what he had to endure uh, in December and January from the, from north of the border. So th there could be a, a trip up. There could be a close game. But I, I think this team's gonna got what it takes to go 12-0-10. You know, I said last year that uh, you had to score 35 points or more to beat Ohio State as the year went on, and I was right, you know. Uh, this year, I think Ohio State is going to be much better on defense. I am drinking that Kool-Aid, that uh, Jim Knowles stirred Kool-Aid. You start Kool-Aid and Knowles with a K, so there you go. That has that uh, that symmetry to it. 
But uh, I do believe they go 12-0. and 0. I think this team is going to get better as the season goes on. The schedule favors Ohio State dramatically in my point. I don't think Penn State is quite the team that even it was last year. That's the one road game that's interesting. You know, I know everybody's fired up about Northwestern right now, but I like Ohio State for the fact that I think it's toughest – his toughest games are at home, starting with Notre Dame, including Wisconsin, including Iowa, and including, of course, Michigan. The Michigan State trip is intriguing to me, but it's not near the end of the year. It's in the middle of the year, which I think bodes well for Ohio State. And uh, so I pick Ohio State to go 12-0. and Now, that means Ohio State will play in the Big Ten championship game for the fifth time in six years. Is that right? Do I have that right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, uh, who will Ohio State play in the Big Ten championship game? The winner of the Big Ten West will be. Man, Tim, I'm so glad. Are you going to say are we going to say Nebraska like everybody else did a week ago? I'm so glad we didn't record this before Saturday because I was I was going to. Not pick, me. I, I still got the same answer. I was going to pick Nebraska because I kind of started to buy into the the revamp and I like the coaching moves that Scott Frost made, but then. He can't get out of his own way. He keeps tripping Dude. over the same shoelace, man. And uh, with that onside kick, you, you don't, can't. Don't you feel like? Don't you feel like when when they called? I was watching the game with my best buddy uh, Jeff Snook, and I said, "You know what? The other guy Whipple is calling the offensive plays and stuff." And Scott Frost so much wanted to have his imprint, Im, imprint, an impact on this game with a dramatic call. I, I I just know that was what was going on. They're up eleven. Hey, let's really stick it to them here. Wow. I'm, rarely have you seen a play just turn a game like that one did, right? I mean, Tim, pride. Pride is a hell of a drug, Tim. And, pride goes before the fall. And when you get high on pride, you'll do crazy <laughs> things. And <sighs> Frost takes an 11-point lead, gets a little chesty, gets that chest out, starts beating it a little. And, and man, pride got the best of him with that onside kick. But, but, so I'm not going to pick Nebraska. They're already only one in the league. Um I don't think Northwestern can sustain what they did um, on Saturday. But you know what? This is the Northwestern year. Yeah. Yeah. And even year. But uh, I'm going to go a little odd here. I think the Big Ten West is going to be a little bit of a muddled mess. Um, and, and I think teams are going to just beat up on each other. I wouldn't be surprised if the winner of this league, if this this side of the league is 6-3 and three in, in the division wow. or in league play in coming league play. In at Ohio State game. Uh, I'm going to go with Minnesota. You can run the ball. You've got a good defense. P.J. Fleck really works on those guys. You know, it. Mohamed Ibrahim's back. They've got their offensive coordinator that did well in 2019 with Tanner Morgan. Tanner Morgan's back. I look at this Minnesota team. Everybody's talking about Wisconsin. I don't trust Graham Mertz. Braylon Allen can only take them so far. Iowa, I don't trust them as long as a Ferentz is calling the offense. And Nebraska, I can't trust them as long as a former quarterback's calling their plays. And so who's left? I mean, it, it's – I'm, uh, I'm going to go to Indianapolis. You could pick uh, Purdue, man. Uh, you know, I think it comes down to Purdue. I'm, you've already you've already named who I like. I've been liking Minnesota for months now. And like you just said, PJ Fleck has built a real program up there. It's stout from the from the bottom to the top, in my opinion. They've got some depth involved. Are they the most uh, over the top uh, 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 exciting team to watch? I don't think so. But I do like Minnesota to come out of the West. But I tell you, Purdue, I really like that quarterback at Purdue. He came on big time at the end of the year last year, and uh, we'll see where that takes him. But uh, but I'm with you, man. You stole – you didn't steal it. That's like when somebody says in our press conference, oh, yeah, Tim stole my – Stole my question or whatever. I'm just going, dude. You came to the, you came to the press conference with one question. Seriously, you came to the Brian Day press conference with one question. But the bottom line is, uh, I like Minnesota for all the reasons you delineate. So, end of discussion. Before we name every team in the West, uh, which I think you did, by the way, except Purdue and Illinois. Uh, and Illinois. Well, yeah. Uh, watch Brett Bielema do his thing, or is a or is a. Uh, People who hate Brett Bielema call him Burt Bielema. Your college football playoff final four. This is your last shot to get a a true true prediction in uh, of your final four. Uh, who is your college football playoff final four? I am going to. Play. Wait, a minute, you're not going to ditto Desmond Howard, are you? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, as as much as I would love to pick the same four teams Desmond did, I think I could do a 
a random, you know, 500 simulations of the season. You could pull none names them, out of a hat. None of, them be as good. Me, none of them would tell me the galaxy brain stuff that I learned from Desmond on Saturday morning. Um, I think this, this playoff is going to have some familiarity to it, but I also think there might be some new, new blood in there. I'm going to go Alabama and Ohio State at the very top. Um, I don't trust Clemson's offense enough to put them in there. I know that's a, another trendy pick. Give me uh, Georgia just because I think I don't think anybody gets them. I think they they lose in the SEC championship game at 12 and 0 and, and get in at 12 and 1. And then Tim, defense and good quarterback play, and if you can run the ball, you're not going to out physical these guys. That fourth team's going to be Utah, and and Tim that. Cameron Rising is a, is a damn good quarterback. That defense replaces a ton, especially at the linebacker spot, but Clark Phillips can lock guys down. There's a lot of hype around USC, uh, some, some sleeper picks uh, to win the Pac-12 around a team like Washington, maybe Oregon, but you give me that consistency all day long, and if you go down to the swamp on Saturday and get a big win, just to kick the season off in the heat uh, and, and the humidity down there in Gainesville – Kyle Whittingham's going to have these guys focused and ready to go for all 12 contests. I don't see them losing. Uh, and if they do, it's going to be one game. Utah sneak in at the four spot. That's fine by me. And then you get Utah, Alabama, Ohio State, Georgia. We've got a hell of a playoff there, Tim. Yeah, so much hanging on that uh, Utah visit to Florida. The good thing for Utah is the game is at night, 7 p.m. kickoff. But uh, but it's still going to be hot there in the swamp. I mean, my buddy Snook, Jeff Snook, you know, he points out he thinks the two hottest stadiums going – or the uh, Miami Gardens, you know, whatever they call that down there, where the uh, where the Hurricane play and the uh, Dolphins play, and then and then the Swamp. He goes, the Swamp just like has no circulation on down on the field and stuff, and it just the heat just gets in there even in, in the nighttime and just hangs around. Uh, I like I like Alabama. I like I like the chalk aspect of this. Alabama and Ohio State. Uh, boy, Georgia, you know, Georgia lost a lot on defense, man, and. Uh, you know, I know this is going to make you blanch a little bit. I think they could get upset by the likes of Tennessee. I think Tennessee's going to be pretty damn good on offense, believe it or not. And uh, I like Billy Napier at Florida to really turn that thing around. So that Florida-Utah game has got a lot of ramifications for me. But I'm going to go uh, Ohio State, Alabama. I think Clemson does bounce back uh, and it figures out a way to get there. And then I like Utah also if Utah passes the test at Florida. But it's no ifs and buts. We're making our predictions. But the other team I do like, and I may throw them in there and take Utah out, and this is a little bit more Desmond Howard-ish. I like Baylor because I think Baylor has a chance to run the table in the Big 12. Watch, he'll get beat on Saturday. But I think they have a chance to run the table in the Big 12 and win the Big 12 for the second straight year. And uh, people are sleeping on Baylor. I think that's a pretty damn good football team. Should so, I give a should I give a sleeper then for the yeah? Give me football? one sleeper, not four. Don't name four. Give me one. I got one. Well, if Dylan Gabriel's good, Oklahoma is good. Yes. Um, when you put the talent that they have offensively, even after losing Mario Williams and even after losing Caleb Williams, the the offensive talent is still there. And if Dylan Gabriel is good, like he's been good at UCF, and he, that can translate to the Big Twelve their defense will be improved under Brent Venables. It's, it can't be any worse than it was under Alex Grinch. And so if you put defense and just sheer talent, because Oklahoma is the most talented in that league together, I don't see why Oklahoma can't do the thing and get there at, at 13-0 and, and and you know beat a Texas or a Baylor twice or an Oklahoma State twice and uh, you know win the Big 12 and get to the college football playoff. Oklahoma has as good of a shot just as Utah does. But you know Utah's got that marquee – matchup that might prove to be the difference if they both are, you know, one loss conference champions and you got a Utah team with a win at Florida yep. and Oklahoma sitting there with three non-conference wins that don't equal that, you know, we, we could have a discussion there, but I wouldn't be surprised at all to see Oklahoma be the team to face Alabama in that one four matchup. Okay. So your final four in, in, in retrospect here, before we uh, sign off your final four are Ohio state, uh, Alabama, who Georgia, Georgia, and and Utah, yep. And I I went with Ohio State, Alabama, Clemson, and Baylor. Finally, yep. right? Just to be different. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here. You probably didn't hear it here first, but you definitely heard it here loudest and the most. Well, I think we broke down about forty-five teams there before we got to our final four, which is what you hope the college football playoff committee does, right, Spence? 
Oh, absolutely, Tim. Absolutely. Right. Well, uh, ladies, you, ladies, now you, you know why I call him the glue man. This glue man, he knows all the he knows where all the dendrites should connect, you know, in my brain. And he keeps me on the straight and narrow. And uh Spence, I'm looking forward to a, a good season with you, my man. And uh, we got a lot of things coming up on Letterman Row this week, too, that people need to check out. Give me give me some highlights there before we before we sign off. Uh, yeah, we'll have full coverage of the press conference uh, to, on on Tuesday morning with Ryan Day. We'll have coverage from the Woody on Wednesday, the practice report, rapid reaction, whatever you want to call it. Um, plenty of video content coming. Um, and then Thursday and Friday, it'll be, you know, we'll have some predictions for the game. And Saturday morning, maybe I'll even make a game pick, Tim. I'd love yeah. to get a score prediction from you before we sign off, though. Yeah. You mean before we sign? Not No, I'm going to save my score prediction for before that preview of the game. Is that all right? Yeah. Hey, this is your show, Tim. I'm just but let me tell you something. One of my one of the scores in my score prediction has a four in it. I'll just put it that away. I'll just leave it. Leave people suspended uh, in animation here. But uh, but yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to this. Now, of course, all our little stories we're going to be throwing in there on LettermanRow.com. Also, uh, you know, I'm supposed to be writing a little bit more this year than I did last year, right? And uh, I'm looking forward to it. And I hope that piece on Emeka Egbuka jumps up there before the week's out. I mean, I thought that was a pretty good story, didn't you? You proofread it, haven't you? Oh yeah, it'll be on it'll be on the site uh, by the time these folks watch this show. It will be already have been on the site. And have already gotten the people excited to watch Emeka Buka return a couple kicks for touchdowns on Saturday. Yeah, and it, it, there's a throwback reference in it to it for the last time Notre Dame came to this uh, came to the Ohio Stadium. Notice I'm throwing all those D's in there, almost tongue in cheekish. But uh, while everybody's talking about the Eddie George run and uh, all these other things, I mean that little catch and run by Terry Glenn really just lit the fire, you know. And uh, Sean Springs had a tremendous interception in that game, uh, kind of. Uh, out outfoxed uh, Ron Palace uh, to make a dramatic stop of a promising Notre Dame drive. So yeah, that that game in 1995. We're going we're going to talk about that a little in the previews going into this game. You know, it really has nothing to do with the game that's coming up on Saturday night. But it but what it was, it was the first win in Ohio State history over Notre Dame. So it has some significance. Uh, that's why you look back on it. And man, what a star-studded Ohio State team that was, right? Yeah, and we'll see another star-studded Ohio State team on Saturday night Saturday against the game team that that has its share of, of superstars that will be NFL draft picks. Uh, Tim, yeah. it's, it's it's the most anticipated game I've been a part of now. This is four years on the beat. I think it's even got a little bit more juice to it with it with Marcus Freeman with James Laurinaitis than even the the, the Clemson rematch had. Yeah, because you just you just had that feeling Ohio State was going to get that thing done. This one. You've just got all the anticipation from an offseason and, and the loss to Michigan and the Rose Bowl. It all comes to a head on Saturday night, Tim, and I am I am so excited to get in the horseshoe for that one. Well, save some of that juice for our videos down the down the road headed to the stadium. You know what I mean? Headed to headed to this game. And uh yeah, I'm looking forward to it too for the very same reasons you just pointed out. But ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining the Tim May podcast again. My man, uh glue man, uh, uh Spencer Holbrook, thanks for being my my co-pilot again, man. I look forward to many more of these as this season progresses. And don't forget my Urban's Take uh, video. It's going to drop late every Wednesday during the season. At least it's scheduled to do that. Urban has a schedule of his own, as we all know. But uh, you know what? Until next week, for Spencer Holbrook, Glue Man, this is Tim May. We'll see you then.